But for now, this is just, at least geometrically, what this boost is going to do. It's effectively just taking our orthogonal axes and kind of skewing them together. But now, let's try and come up with, physically at least, what this is actually corresponding to. So I'll just rub out a bit of this to make some more space. So now, what we should realise is that this new boosted set of coordinates is another reference frame. So we started in some stationary particles reference frame, the, part, the reference frame X. I'm just going to label it X. And we're then boosting, we're doing a Lorentz transformation into some new frame, the X hat frame. And now we want to kind of have some interpretation of what this boosted frame is going to correspond to. So to do that, it's probably quite useful to consider a point in the boosted frame. So let's look at the origin in the boosted frame. On this picture, we're going to conveniently say that our origi origins are going to coincide at this point. So at the coordinate value in the X frame, t equals zero, and the coordinate value t hat equals zero, we're just going to say that they correspond to the same point. And now what we're going to want to do is we're going to want to see how does the origin of this x hat coordinate system appear in the, in the x coordinate system. Okay, so I'm just going to redraw this picture briefly because it's gotten a bit messy. Okay, so what we now want to do is we want to have some interpretation for what this boosted frame corresponds to. And so the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to essentially choose an interesting point in the x hat frame, and we're going to look at how that point appears in the, in the x frame. So maybe for clarity, let's call the unhatted frame, the x frame, the observer A, and then let's call the x hat frame the observer B, and now by the observers A and B, A sits at the origin of the X frame, and B sits at the origin of the X hat frame. So our two observers just simply sit at the origins of their respective frames, but now we can use this to, to, to view the world line of one from the perspective of the other. So let's say we're going to stay stationary at the A frame, so this is us at the A frame, and we're now looking at how this B frame appears to us. So we're watching the observer sat at the origin of this X hat frame. We're essentially just looking at how that world line appears in our frame. So now, what's the observer B going to be doing? Well, in their frame, they just stay constantly fixed at the origin of their frame. So they're effectively traveling along a world line which just travels along the T hat axis. So if you stay fixed in the B frame at coordinate value X hat equals zero, remember we've said that values of constant X coordinate are given by the, not quite perpendicular, but the the line of the other coordinate that passes through it. And so a line of constant x hat is going to be at this point, simply just given by this t hat axis. If we were, say, at this point x, the line of constant x hat would be a parallel line to the t hat axis. But for our case, since we're starting at the origin, this now yellow line is the world line of this observer B as viewed by the reference frame A. So the observer A simply just sees B travelling on a straight line in its reference frame. So as B travels 
along its own time axis, this observer A, this is the world line that it sees in its frame, and now we can immediately see if A sees this world line in its frame, it's going gonna, it's gonna to think that this observer B is now moving throughout its frame. Because now just really intuitively this world line has some non-zero x component and t component, so it's going to have some velocity, four velocity, and so this four velocity is going to produce some coordinate velocity in the frame A, and so this frame A thinks that this observer B is moving relative to them with some coordinate speed V. So now this is what the boost has done, it's transformed the coordinates A into the reference frame B, and this A reference frame now sees the reference frame B moving with some coordinate velocity in their frame. So this is now where the terminology of boost comes from. Essentially this transformation is boosting you from a stationary into a moving frame. And so now this is how we use these Lorentz transformations to transform between the coordinates used by observers that are moving relative to each other. So now let's explore this. This was simply just kind of a geometric reasoning for how this boost is going to function. Now let's see it algebraically. So if you remember we were considering how the origin of this B frame appears in the old coordinates. So the origin of the B frame is given by x hat equals zero. So if x hat equals zero, we know that this is given by this expression in terms of the old coordinates. So we can write, this is simply how, now as viewed by the x and t coordinates, this would be now simply just the world line of the x hat origin. And now we can manipulate this expression. If I just bring one of these over to this side, and now this is going to give, and now if I simply just divide that cosh, okay. So this expression is now how the x coordinates, how they are going to see, or rather this, this expression is now Remember, we were looking at how this x hat appears in the old coordinates. And so you can realize that this x here is giving the coordinate value of x hat just as it appears in the A frame. And so this x, or rather ct tanch psi, is now the world line that this origin of the B frame is going to follow in the x frame. Okay, so now I have an expression, x, it can be a bit misleading because this is just x, but it now is the expression that gives the world line for this position x hat equals zero, which just gives it x coordinates in the A frame. But now this is just a world line, essentially, I can consider the usual properties which we would like, say, the coordinate velocity. So if I just take the derivative, I'm simply going to find now that the coordinate velocity as measured by the A-frame is the following. So this V is this coordinate velocity, and it's essentially how fast this A reference frame sees the origin of the B-frame moving through the A-frame. So after the boost, this now the boosted moving frame is seen to move through the original frame with a coordinate velocity of c tangent psi.
So we can now realise another statement of an incredibly important fact that we've kind of already met before. But if we now look at this expression, if I just remind you what this tanch of psi is going to look like, just simply plotting tanch of psi as some function that looks like this, and these horizontal asymptotes are at plus and minus one. So this is psi, and this is tanch psi. So the thing to realize now is that this lambda parameter we said was just a, a real parameter, it just comes from R. And I'm now going to tell you it's an affine parameter, i.e. it runs all the way from plus to minus infinity. And so this tanch psi function is essentially bounded to be between plus and minus one. And so that immediately now constrains this coordinate velocity to be between plus and minus c. So we've now realized another statement of the fact that you can't ever travel with a coordinate velocity that's greater than this constant c. We saw previously how we could realize this from looking at the fall velocity, and we saw that our fall velocity vector can only ever point within what we call the forward light cone. And now this is simply just another statement of the fact that your coordinate velocity is measured by any frame, that velocity can never exceed plus or minus c. So now we can have a, a better interpretation for what this parameter psi actually represents. This psi is usually referred to as the rapidity, and it effectively controls how fast you're boosting to because it, well, it, yeah, it controls here the coordinate velocity that the boosted frame is going to be seen to be moving with. And so if you boost with a, a really large rapidity, you're going to see that frame moving very fast away from you. And then likewise, with a very negative rapidity, it's going to be just traveling very, very fast in the other direction. And just from the really fundamental fact now that this tanch function is simply constrained between 1 and minus 1. We've just simply arrived at the realization that we can never have coordinate velocity greater than c. So we're going to explore this in much more detail coming up. We're going to have some nice formulae involving these hyperbolic functions that are then going to connect to maybe some things which you might have seen from more elementary courses on relativity. But for now, just to summarise everything I introduced here, we were, first of all, trying to work out what exactly a Lorentz boost is doing. We simply worked out how it affects our space and time coordinate. We can see here that it's kind of now mixing between the coordinates. Our new time coordinate is somehow a combination of the old space and time coordinates. And by using this transformation formula, we were able to, first of all, look at what these new coordinates are going to look like. It kind of skews the axes inwards like this. But now this <laughs> rotation or skewing inwards of the axes like this is what's known as a hyperbolic rotation. And the amount by which they skew together is going to be dependent on this rapidity. And so the faster you travel, the closer and closer they pinch together towards the light cone. And so an extremely large boost is going to very, very closely pinch these new axes together. So in upcoming videos, we're going to have a lot more fun looking at these space-time diagrams and looking at how intervals are going to appear in both of these coordinates, and we're going to see that the boosted and the non-boosted coordinates are going to disagree about things like distances and how much time has elapsed between two points and even how much space interval has elapsed between two points. But we're going to be able to derive many of the relativistic physical effects like time dilation and length 
contraction, just simply purely geometrically on a figure like this. But that will be coming up in the next few videos. For now, we've just realised that these new coordinates are essentially corresponding to an observer that's moving through the old coordinates with some coordinate velocity. But we've now been able to arrive, just simply looking at the transformation, another expression for this coordinate velocity, and we've again realised that this velocity is constrained to always be plus or minus, to be within plus or minus c. So just to note then, that this is a, a purely geometric transformation, we're just doing some linear geometric transformation of the axes, and this Effectively, this speed limit, if you like, is a fundamental feature of the geometry. We're not imposing anything extra. We're just simply looking at the geometry and looking how the geometry allows things to move through that geometry. And we've realized that this fundamental speed limit is an intrinsic part of the geometry to do with how these transformations work between stationary and moving observers. So we really can't get away from this fact that you can never travel faster than this fundamental constant C. And I'm trying to stay far away as I can from de determining what this C is. We're going to do that when we come to kinematics, but for now I just want to keep it as arbitrary as I can and just noting that it's some constant. But as we're seeing more and more, this constant is seemingly fundamentally connected with the geometry and it fundamentally affects the dynamics within the geometry. And so we're going to explore much more what this C, at least physically, is going to represent when we start talking about kinematics. But for now, it's just a constant and our geometry is telling us that we can never travel with a speed that's greater than the value of this constant.